Now we're going to turn to um, a different topic. Um, Shelby Jones is going to talk about rescuing data from people who, who from uh, data archives that were, were never put into digital form. And uh, so um, she's got the <clears throat> pleasant task of sifting through rat infested <laughs> paper archives. So this is a, a note of warning to all of us uh, older people that we should do this before we die <laughs> because it's a lot easier. <laughs> um, so Shelby's going to um, start now. Thank you, Shelby. Take it away. Thanks, Lisa. And you definitely quoted what, something I was going to say, which was, please do this now. <laughs> That's one of the main points that I was going to make because it is way easier to work with people when they're still alive than to try to read through their documents when you no longer have access to their knowledge. So, um, but thank you for inviting me to present at this conference. I'm really, really excited to share this work that I've been doing over the last six years as part of my dissertation. Um, it's a huge collaboration project. So before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge a few key players in this project and kind of what their roles were. So obviously Lisa um, is my advisor at UCSD and my other advisor here in New Mexico with the Department of Cultural Affairs is Eric Blinman and he played a huge role in this project and you'll see that in a handful of slides. Um, but then there is contributions from Jeff Cox, Stacey Lingell, Robert Sternberg, Jeff Amy, Dan Wolfman and Robert Du Bois. Yes, it's pronounced Du Bois. <laughs> Um, but none of this work would be possible without the contributions from Ariel and the magic, just the entire group, um, but specifically Nick, because Nick really helped me every step of the way when I was running into problems with trying to format my disparate data sets into one. Nick was with me every step of the way. So I wanted to acknowledge Nick, but also acknowledge what Nick said in the last kind of question and answer about really involve the folks from MAGIC ahead of time because it makes your life way easier and it makes the whole process kind of more streamlined. So that's a little plug there. And then um, Robert Rex was our private donor who basically funded all of this and primarily Ariel's, the undergrad who typed all this data up, her compensation for typing up all this data. So without further ado, um, let's get into this using MAGIC as a fair repository for legacy archaeomagnetic data, a case study from North America. So I'm really quick going to go through this, but as Andrew Roberts said earlier this evening, this is an expert group, so I'm not going to go through this in too many details. But suffice to say that our knowledge of Earth's magnetic field comes from three sources direct measurements of the field, measurements of magnetic remnants preserved in rocks, or in this case, archeological material, and computer simulations that we then plug those direct measurements and um, rock measurements into. So a question that easily follows this discussion is if we want to improve our knowledge of the magnetic field, how do we do that? And one of the ways we can do that is through the improvement of our records. And that kind of leads me into the next point is what do we need for that? Well, we need some really obvious things, spatial and temporal diversity in our data sets. In most cases, we want full vector and, um, records. We want referenceable and citable chronology, um, which goes into playing with like the magic data sets uh, Anthony Coppers was talking about, including those data in there. We want some ability to do quality control and we need those data to be findable and accessible. So basically we need data that in short is FAIR compliant. So Nick introduced this idea Tuesday morning during the workshop welcome that FAIR is an acronym. It's a relatively recent concept, but it builds on the fundamental scientific philosophy of sharing data and results. FAIR principles sounds for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it acts as a set of guidelines for the development of digital data repositories. 
The impetus for developing the FAIR principles came as a response to scientific and governmental funding agencies requiring data management and stewardship plans for data in the long term. Um, but the issue really quickly became, and in some cases still is, what is the definition of good management? Traditionally, that was left up to the repository owners, which you will see in my case was hit or miss, and there is no consistency between archives. And that's what fail principles, attempts, and aims to address. Um, basically streamlining that definition of what good management is, and in a way that emphasizes the data rather than the scholar. And that's something that the paleomagnetic community has recognized really early on and has done a fantastic job at really incorporating FAIR principles into our work. Um, so over the last couple of decades, global efforts, um, and I'm only listing a few here, um, and funding have been devoted to creating accessible and collaborative online repositories. And this action really revolutionized the data sharing within our community. Um, and I'm again, not gonna go into that because Anthony did such a great job in talking about those grand challenges that these collaborations and these online repositories have really helped with and where magic in particular is going. Um, but that leads me to a quote from the flagship paper um, Wilkinson et al. 2016, and I'm going to read it since this is recorded, but beyond proper collection, annotation, and archival, data stewardship includes the notion of long-term care of valuable digital assets with the goal that they should be discovered and reused for downstream investigations, either alone or in combination with newly generated data. And while this is a fantastic quote, and I definitely agree with it, um, it's kind of missing something. And it's because of this key word that they put in there of digital assets. And that really inadvertently limits the spirit of FAIR principles. And instead, I feel like we should be expanding this definition to include all assets, all valuable assets, even if those, and especially those, that are not yet digital, but are still foundational to our discipline, these so-called legacy data sets. And that's the basis of my thesis and what I will be discussing today, using MAGIC as the data's final online repository. So why <laughs> legacy data? I get this question a lot, so I'm like starting out right at the front with it. Why spend six years digitizing old data from machines that you know nothing about in formats that boggle the mind. And in one case, I had 12 formats. And in one case, even Lisa and I could not together figure out what this format was trying to tell us. Um, and it's a very valid question. Like, why do this? Why use legacy data? There's so much opportunity to go get new data. Why not just do that? But there is a ton of reason to use these legacy data sets and to digitize them for the broader community. Um, so the first three on this list are really general. The bottom ones are more specific to my project. But first, I really want to point out that like fundamentally and ethically, looking at these legacy data sets honors the scientists and their life work, especially some of the scientists in this field, because so many of our scientists have devoted their entire careers to studying Earth's magnetic field. So using their data and acknowledging their data and making it available really honors their efforts and them as a scientist. Um, but more specifically, most of these specimens have been collected using public funds. And so we have an ethical responsibility as scientists to report to our funding agencies. And in this case, because they were public funds, in a way that's our entire global community of even non-scientists. Like this data needs to be available for all of us to be able to use. Um, and again, these studies really form the foundation of some modern studies. Um, but the fourth is more specific to my area and very applicable to my project um, because I work on archeological data sets. These are archeomagnetic samples that were collected from archeological sites and burned features within those sites. 
And access to those sites can change through time and in many cases has changed due to politics, due to ethics, due to legislation. Um, and so that really limits the ability to go back and collect new samples from either the same areas or similar areas. Um, additionally, archaeology is inherently destructive. Um, it's not something we commonly think about, but when you are excavating an archaeological site and you're excavating through the burned layers, the burned features, the fire pits, a lot of times the goal of archaeology is to look at the lowest stratigraphic layer of occupation. So that means you're going to be digging through and excavating through all of those overlying layers and overlying time periods of, ex of occupation, which means once you go through those layers, you can no longer access those burned features for archaeomagnetism. And then specifically to the United States, almost all of the archaeology we do today is related to compliance archaeology due to modern construction coming through and potentially destroying sites that are in the way. And so the compliant part, the legislation part, is that archaeologists go in, they survey and record those sites. And then if the construction crew has to build a road right through the middle of the site and destroy it, that's now considered legal. So again, we can't go back to those sites. Um, and specifically, again, to my location, which is the Four Corners region of the United States Southwest, almost all of our archaeomagnetic sites that were collected from have more precise and more accurate chronologies than rocks. And it's common that we can actually date things down to 10 to 50 year time windows, which is really important when we're trying to create high quality models. And then kind of a fun plug is you can get massive amounts of data in just a short period of time when you look at legacy data and put that into the global database. So switching gears a little bit, over the last six years I've been working on bringing three laboratories of archaeomagnetic data into FAIR compliance and these data sets are were developed starting in 1964 with an academic lineage of three scientists, Robert Du Bois and his two students, Daniel Wolfman and Jeffrey Amy. And they developed these US-based archaeomagnetic research programs. Um, and for decades, they were the only three groups that essentially did all of the archaeomagnetism in North America. Um, and then they started to partner with people in Mesoamerica and they developed their own programs. But for a long time, these were the only groups, and especially, and still today, some of the only groups in the United States. Um, collectively, since 1964, they analyzed over 5,300 archaeomagnetic sites, and that's over 51,000 specimens for direction, um, primarily from the Western Hemisphere in North America, which you can see on this globe right here. They have a few from the Eastern Hemisphere, but not really. Most of them are from North America and most of them are from the United States. Um, yet despite their effort and their decades of work, very few journal publications resulted from their data sets. Instead, most of their published results are embedded in archeological reports, which limits the data's findability and accessibility. And furthermore, when they were published, which is something that we were kind of talking about in that question and answer recently, is they weren't always published with com the completeness of the data set that we would expect today. A lot of times it was just the average site level results and they often use different conventions than today's standards and that has limited the data's comparability and reusability. So I wanted to take a step back and kind of look at the bigger picture for a second. And that's what I'm showing here. This is a map of the distribution of 3,100 directional archaeomagnetic sites from around the world. All of these sites that you see depicted here are less than 2,000 years old. And I want you to know that this site, I literally downloaded this data yesterday. So this data is from the Geomagia database from yesterday. It's pretty much the most complete that we can get for this time period this week. Um, and what you can see here is that we have a whole bunch of locations that have samples that have been taken and studied for archaeomagnetic direction. The red histograms represent the age distribution over the last 2000 years of the samples that are within that latitude and longitude region. And the color behind the histograms, which ranges from white to almost black, 
that coloring is dependent on the density of the samples that are found in there. So what you can see is we have a lot of specimens and samples and studies from Europe, not surprising. We have no studies from parts of Russia and we have very few studies from other locations in the world. But what you're probably noticing is we do have a fairly high density of samples from the region that I'm studying, which is kind of this Western North America. And almost all of these that you see in the Western hemisphere, and there's 600 sites on this plot from the Western hemisphere, almost all of these are results of publications that are coming out of these three US-based archaeomagnetic laboratories. Yet almost none of these data are vetted. And if we remove the 500 sites that are associated with these legacy archives, only about 100 of those sites are left. And they're mostly from Mesoamerica and South America. And those are pretty much modern studies with groups that are still active. And so another huge reason that I wanted to look at these data in particular is first off, they're important to the records in this area. But secondly, these data sets have been used to develop archaeomagnetic dating curves. And they have been and still are being used to conduct archaeomagnetic dating in this region. And the region I'm talking about right now is specifically the four corners states of the United States. So this little blip right here is California. The solid line is the US-Mexican border. And we have the states of Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. And the data points that you see on this plot are data points that are within the data set that I am studying. But it's not always clear what data points of this entire massive amount that you see here are being used in these VGP curves or virtual geomagnetic pole curves. And these are the kind of curves that are used for archaeomagnetic dating in this region. And you'll see them in the next slide. Um, so it's not always clear what data went into those. And it's not always clear what independent chronology was used or because most of it is unsighted. Um, and again, that really affects the data's reusability. So one of the other kind of key points was to look at these curves. So for time's sake, I'm only going to discuss the top three of this, this set of five. The reason I'm only talking about these top three is these are the three that have been and continue to be used for archaeomagnetic dating in this region. And what I want you to really notice about these is they do show similar first order movements. Um, and you can see that in this loop at about, whoa, where did my cursor go? This loop at about 800. And then it curves over to here at this loop at about 11 to 1200. And you kind of see that in all of these three at the top, but the shape of those curves is very different. So you can imagine that that creates a huge ambiguity when you're trying to use these models for dating. And so really quick, because this is such a big project, I really wanted to go over the project objectives before we get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, but really, we, all we wanted to do initially was digitize, format, vet these data, and then upload them to MAGIC. <laughs> we expanded our, our aim a lot. Um, but now we have tried to cite where possible as many archaeological reports, who the scientists were, who the archaeologists were, what chronology methods were used, and to reanalyze the data sets where possible. Um, and then to verify that the different laboratories' data actually are comparable and there's no bias in one laboratory's set of data. And then kind of a subcategory of this was we ended up redefining the names of the U.S. regions for curve development. And you'll see that on the next slide. Um, and then a goal is to develop a new version of the Four Corners VGP reference curves that you saw on the previous slide. Um, but again, really quick before we continue, because I'm going to be saying terminology that you may not have been familiar with. Um, and partially that's because the magic definition of site is different than the archaeological definition of site. And I will try to be really specific when I talk about those in this talk. But the archaeological definition of a site includes the entire site of occupation, even if that site was reoccupied 100 years later it's still generally considered one archaeological site. And the magic definition of, an of a site is a single heated event. So we had to redefine what site meant for us in this data set 
and we have defined it as a single archaeological feature, a feature being defined as a burned wall, a floor, a kiln, a fire pit, things like that that would be applicable for archaeomagnetic study. And then in this case, because the sampling protocol was to collect cubes, which you can see depicted down here, and there are two different size cubes in relation to a standard paleomagnetic core, and the scale is in centimeters. Um, our sample and our specimen are actually the same in, in, in this case. So what we decided to do was a specimen is in core coordinates. And then when we applied that field azimuth correction and we made the data into geographic coordinates and transformed it, we call that a sample. So I will be using those terms kind of interchangeably with cube because all of these were collected as a cube. Um, and then the regions that I will be referring to in this presentation are the Four Corners regions, formerly known as the Southwest Curve, but that's ambiguous because <laughs> part of the data from Mexico can get included in this from the northern part, and it was just very ambiguous. And what about California? So we're redefining it as the Four Corners because the states of Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado all meet at the Four Corners um, at this single point and then Lower Mississippi River, which was formerly known as the Southeast Curve. Um, so moving right along into a description of the archives, which Lisa very nicely kind of foreshadowed, is we had lots of data from lots of different archives. Um, and the three that I mostly worked on were the Du Bois archive, which had almost 2,000 archaeological features that were sampled and measured. But all of their data were in paper documents. And as much as that's a great thing, because we still have them, some of the digital documentation that Du Bois put together on floppy disks and punch cards did not survive. But the digital or the printed documents did not survive well in terms of their storage. So I did have to wear gloves and masks and be really careful with this data set because a lot of the data was moldy and a lot of it had rodent damage. Fortunately, Du Bois was really good at duplicating and triplicating his data. So almost all of the data that he ever collected, we still have access to, but it's locked in this printed form that's not tabulated. And that's where Ariel came in and actually typed up all the necessary data that we needed, which took many years to do. The Wolfman data set, we had about 1400 features. Um, almost all of those data are preserved in either these binders you can see at the top as printed documents and a handful are preserved as digital documents. And in both the Bois case and the Wolfman case, we have all the samples. The Jeff, Amy, Stacey, and Gell data set provided the most data at 2000 features. And these data were provided to us in a digital format that you can see here that we had to reformat, but we're still working to understand if the field notes and the specimen cubes are accessible. And then not to put Robert Sternberg on like in the spotlight, but I did want to acknowledge that he is another contributor to this and he is fantastic. He is so fun to work with. But in addition to that, he's really been actively working with Nick, myself and my boss here in New Mexico, Eric, to preserve not only his digital data, but physical scientific archive. So I really wanted to recognize him and recognize his tremendous effort to, that he's putting in to preserve his own legacy, which is great. And as Lisa said, we should all be doing that. So little plug there. Um, but I wanted to address that where Sternberg did, is doing this amazing thing. Du Bois really didn't have a plan for his scientific estate. So after he died and then his wife fell into dementia, it was really by a series of accidents that we got his data. And we only got his data because of private donations and with two weeks notice before it went in the landfill. To give you an idea of what that is, that is 12,000 pounds of data, samples and machines that you can see here that we are now storing in this office place, the Office of Archaeological Studies in New Mexico. And we really don't have an idea of what to do with all this data and all of these samples because there's not really much funding available. But we're still working through it because it's an enormous and important set of data. And especially because of this partnership with Hari over here, who's an archaeologist that excavated things south of Phoenix at the Snaketown Archaeological Site. And together, this partnership actually developed 
uh, entire chronology for that site based on archaeomagnetic dating. And so we having access to these records, again, goes back to that idea of these data are foundational to studies that we still use. That Hari chronology is still used by archaeologists today in Arizona. So the methods that we used, aside from typing up a ton of data and reformatting a ton of digital documents, are really pretty standard to the paleomagnetic directional community. Um, so we applied a set of criteria to the specimens and we applied a set of criteria to the sites, the magic sites, so that's the one heated feature. Um, but we did run into some wrinkles and that was pretty expected because we're working with legacy data, but it was unexpected in the sense that if you look here at these sample data, so these are corrected for geographic field azimuth orientation, all of these are less than 2,000 years old, we should expect to see samples that are facing north. And we do, that's this green cluster. But we also had samples that were clustering at east, south, and west. And so what we had to do was actually correct these data and use clustering to filter these data sets out and then apply a 90, 180, or 270 degree fix so that we could get all of our data to point in the expected northerly direction for New Mexico in the Four Corners region. Um, and we attributed this mistake to just mistakes in the field using a Brunton on the wrong side of a cube. Um, and it's pretty easy to do. Um, but the Amy data set had a different problem. Um, and their problem was basically that half of the data we got, a little less than half, you can see here in pink, was already corrected for field azimuth and was already in geographic coordinates when we were given it, but this was not noted. And so we had to de determine that we were accidentally double correcting our samples um, for field azimuth and we had to actually pair together all of the green data points from our sample table and then all of the pink data points that you see here from our specimen uncorrected table. When we upload this into MAGIC, that is noted. So you guys don't have to worry about this. That is already done. You can just use the data set as is. And the Du Bois data set followed the same challenge that the Wolfman data set had. So once we did all of our fixes, we were able to actually go through and accept our samples and our sites as quality or less than quality. And that's what you're seeing here. So on the left-hand side, you see an entire stereo net with black, blue, and red dots. The black dots are from North America, specifically from the US. Blue dots are Mesoamerica and red dots are South America. And these are all of the samples. That's the individual cubes that passed our selection criteria, which you see over here. And it is fairly weak just because of the way that these data were collected in the first place. We didn't have a lot of measurements to do principal component analysis on. And then at the bottom right staring at, you see the accepted sites by region. And these blue ones from Mesoamerica you see here that are plotting with the United States data. That makes sense because these are from Chihuahua, Mexico, which is the province just south of the border. Um, so in tabular format, when we were looking at all of our data divided out by the different regions, we had an enormous amount of data. We had over 5,300 sites, but only a handful of these sites actually had age chronology associated with them. And that's what you're seeing in this column. And then when you apply that acceptance criteria, you see the data in this column that very few had ages, especially from the other regions that we're not going to discuss today for time purposes. But we are gonna discuss the 223 high quality sites that we have in the Four Corners region. And they are exciting and here they are. So here's all of the sites with ages from the Four Corners region. The open dots are all of the data. The closed dots are the good quality data using our selection criteria. And then they're colored by contributor. And you can see here that there is no bias between the contributors, which is great news. So we can treat them as one data set and we did. And that's what this green curve is. This is a first pass model of the variation in the field. So this is a polynomial fit curve of degree 10 plotted with its bootstrap error and uncertainty bounds. Um, and then we did use modeled GUFM, modeled data points from GUFM over the last 300 years just to make sure we were constraining this polyfit 
at the younger ages. So this is just the last 2000 years with present on the right, 2000 years ago on the left. And what we did was we took these declination and inclination curves and we converted them to VGP or virtual geomagnetic pole because that's the convention in the archaeomagnetic community of um, the United States. And that's what I'm presenting here. And these data are color coded by time or by the century that they are from. And that's the data points. Again, the shape is by contributor. And then the curve is color coded by those same century um, colors. So you can see that the pink data points contribute to the pink part of the curve, the blue data points to the blue part of the curve. And what's exciting is we are still seeing, as expected, the same first order um, shape that we did see in those original models that I had showed you. And we're gonna talk about some of the limitations of this in a couple slides. Which brings me to like the last part of my talk, which is going back through these project objectives. What did we succeed at? What do we still need to work at? And then our future goals. So we did the first part, we digitized it, vetted it, all of that. And this will be available in MAGIC at the time of this publication, which will be hopefully sometime this year, um, depending on how fast it goes through review. Um, where possible, we did cite these things and all of the reports and scientists, but I will tell you, this is going to be a multi-year goal to finish this. For each and every archeological site, which could have multiple features, it will take about two to three weeks, we estimate, to determine and cite all of the different data sets that we need to, because that involves going into the libraries and things like that to find these archeological reports. Um, where possible, we did reanalyze using principal component analysis, but this was not always possible because the precedent that Du Bois set was to use a pilot group study, and he often only used two cubes out of an entire feature of potentially eight um, cubes that were sampled. And so we didn't always have the opportunity to use principal component analysis on all of the cubes that were collected. But we have all of those cubes, so we can continue to measure these samples. And I'll show you an example of that on the next slide. Um, and that's what this is. So basically, this top part plot is the United States. All of the solid points are sites that passed our acceptance criteria. All of the open points are sites that have age chronology and have eight cubes per feature. So all of these sites did not pass our magnetic selection criteria. And you notice almost all of them are black circles. That means they're from the Du Bois data set. And that's because of that pilot group limitation. So we can actually go back. We can measure these Du Bois cubes again because we have them. And we can actually conduct a principal component analysis on all the cubes from the feature. And these are kind of our low hanging fruit, our first set of samples that we want to measure again. Um, because we have ages and they have enough specimens per feature that we think that we will likely have a good result. And then, as I said, we'd mentioned this VGP model again. One of the things that's really important to notice in here that we didn't necessarily notice in the declination and inclination curves, because VGP kind of accentuates uncertainties and scatter, is we have data points like these two purple ones that are plotting over by the pole position of the 12 to 1300s, but they're purple. That means that they're 700 years old and they should be plotting ideally over towards Russia and towards Europe. Um, but these may be coming from sites that were occupied in the 700s and then again in the 1200s. And that data was not noted in the data set that we had access to. So that's going to be kind of our first step as well to go through, pick out these few that are more scattered than we expected and go look at their chronology and see if the chronologies are just potentially wrong, which is possible. We're talking about 60 years here. Things change. Shelby, you have to wrap it up. Sorry. I do. Yes. Um, and so that brings us, we verified the data are comparable. We redefined the curves. And now we're in the process of making a new version. So you saw the polynomial fit of degree 10. We're working on a more statistically robust version. Um, and the main points and lessons are that we're lucky to have this data set and all access to these. Um, and that working with legacy data has huge advantages and disadvantages, which I have mentioned kind of over the whole process of this talk. 
Um, so I'm going to skip that for time. And then as Lisa mentioned, we really as a community need to be cognizant and proactive in the preservation of these legacy data sets. Um, things like magic make this way easier to store our digital archives, but we also need to be cognizant about our physical archives as well as our funding for these preservation efforts. And this is my last slide. I'm just going to leave this up here. These are the papers that are coming out with this data set. So subsidiary to this was the intensity records. We looked at those separate and that paper is already out and here's the DOI. Um, this paper is in prep and then I'm working with Kathy to use the data from this to create that better model. And that will use the data from these archives and this intensity paper. So who has any questions? Hey, thank you, Shelby. Um, so if you have questions you don't want to ask out loud, you can put them in the chat or uh, just raise your hand, unmute yourself. No questions? Yep, see some claps. Okay, nice talk, Shelby. So how many tubes do you think? Oh, did somebody else want to say something? Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. I was, I was speaking and I realized my computer mic was muted, uh, but it's, it's on now. Uh, really nice talk. Uh, thanks. Um, really, it seems like a huge effort and I'm excited to see the, the end result. Uh, so I, one of the, I'm working in the Western US now is I've, made use of say the Hagstrom and Bling, Bling, Hagstrom and Blingman 2010 uh, compilation. Um, what, uh, w are there notable differences now between the, what, I mean, I, obviously it's a work in progress to, with the reference curve. And uh, are there notable differences between the two like reference curves that you see now that you think are be important going forward? So as you said, is a co-author on this talk on this mm -hmm. paper. Um, so some of the data that has gone into the Hagstrom and Blinman paper from 2010 is actually from the Du Bois and Wolfman archives. None of the Jeff Amy data is in there. But because of the methodology that Hagstrom really advocated for in that paper, if we go back to that slide, you'll notice that his, that curve is very jagged. And, um, and so, yes, it still captures those general motions that we see in the curves that have been created, including the polynomial fit that I just made. But it's very jagged and it's very difficult if you're trying to use it for arcuomagnetic dating. Um, the big question is, what are your goals with using this data set? Because it is the only one that does go beyond 600 um, common era. So if you want to get anything further back in time. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. So that was like my question to you was what were your goals with using it? Yeah. Now, yeah, mostly I was interested in what kind of the generalized rates of secular duration were like for kind of as, you know, with this very detailed data set. And I mean, and your work on this seem, is, is amazing. So I'm like really excited to see kind of what, yeah, kind of rates of change in the Western United States Four Corners region set. Yeah, so one of the things you'll notice is the amplitude of these loops is smaller. So you're going to have a slightly different rate of change than you would for even the Du Bois and the Langell and Amy curve that you see here. Um, so that is one thing to be cognizant of. But again, if you want to go back beyond 600, you have to use the Hagstrom and Blinman, and it is a good data set. Uh, yeah, thank you for. Uh... Yeah, great talk and uh, yes. you can combine the Hagstrom and Lindman data with Shelby's data that she's going to do and then do another whole thing. <laughs> that's what and that's reusable. the goal, right? Is that to make it reusable for everybody yeah. to get them out of their paper coffins and into the digital era.